So, Eric, um, obviously, um, you, you, you know, I, I, I thought your piece was was great. You you related your experience from a um, a, a, a personal story on some level, or at least uh, your involvement yeah. in it, into a issue that is ongoing, and that is really the accountability of the police. And um, this story for you started, um, I guess it was uh, a, a year or so ago, last Halloween, maybe a little bit less. And um, you're in Brooklyn with your uh, young child going out and Halloweening, and you describe the 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 situation in in Brooklyn, which is yeah. Halloween, and 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 some of these Brooklyn neighborhoods is really um, amazing. That uh, everybody comes yeah. out, and uh, it's it's really crazy. All right, we'll we'll take it from there. What did you see? So uh, yeah, we live in Carroll Gardens, which is this very you know picturesque, uh, lots of brownstones, lots of stoops, um, and as you say, lots of kids out on Halloween. It is uh, good getting in our neighborhood for candy, um, and it was actually my wife who was walking home with uh, our then six-year-old daughter, and. Um, they were walking down the main uh, uh, street in the neighborhood, which is called Court Street. Uh, it's a one-way street. And um, all of a sudden, she saw um, a few teenagers running um, and then an NYPD uh, unmarked car, but with uh, sirens on, um, zooming the wrong way down the one-way street. Um, and this kid was trying to run away and, and uh, jumped out into the street, and the NYPD car hit the kid. Uh, and the um, kid then uh, basically went over the hood, fell off onto the ground. Uh, another witness told me you could hear the crunch uh, when, you know, a human body hits the ground. Um, and uh, But popped up and ran away. Um, and at that point, the cops actually turned their attention to another group of kids um, who were away from, didn't seem to have anything to do with um, these kids who were running away, um, were smaller, were younger. Um, but the one thing that they did all have in common is that they were Black. Um, and the police um, ended up uh, uh, lining a bunch of those kids up against the wall of our neighborhood movie theater um, and arresting those kids. And um, I then tracked what uh, happened. My uh, wife had called me. Uh, she had actually come home. Our, our daughter was upset, understandably, um, had come home with our daughter and told me to go back out. Um, and so I went back out and saw the um, uh, kids being arrested and taken away. Um, and I followed what happened from there. And, and, and to be um, clear, the second set of kids had nothing to do with the first set of kids, right? Correct. I mean, not that we could uh, uh, discern not that at that time. Could see. Not that anybody and, could uh, discern at the time. Yep. And 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 just to be clear, was uh, uh, I mean, in that that at that time was the uh, understanding of everybody uh, around there that the kid who got hit by the car was running from the police, or was he just just it, running it across a, the street? It was a very, uh, uh, you know, I wasn't there right at the moment. It was, uh, I ended up speaking to a bunch of people, including obviously my wife, um, who, uh, uh, who was there. Um, and, you know, it wasn't really clear what was going on. It all happened in, uh, you know, within a few seconds. Um, it later turned out, and the police told me that um, there had been a robbery in a nearby playground. Um, a uh, kid um, had, had, this is according to the police's account, been essentially jumped and had his cell phone stolen. Um, he then flagged down a, um, a cop, and um, they went around the neighborhood um, uh, 
you know, where the um, kid who was in the police car then pointed out uh, who he thought had uh, done it. And that's how um, everything started. But um, hey. but really, and let me just explain a couple of other parts here. You, you know, I, I saw some other very troubling things. Um, I, I obviously didn't know what happened, and I very much wanted to um, – understand it and to hear the police's account. Um, and um, uh, a couple things happened. When I asked the police about it, they said um, that your wife didn't see what she thought she saw. Um, now, that was that. Into three. Well, just to be clear, yeah, that was ahead. you when you went out there and asked, yeah. you were asking the police essentially at that time or later? No, no. What what happened was, and so the, the the actual chronological version is, I, I went out there. Um, the the kids. Um, first of all, a couple of other troubling things happened. One, and and this is stuff I saw. Um, the kids had been put in a police van, and um, uh, uh, there had been five kids. They had lined up against the wall, all black. Um, two of them they had let go, um, and. Uh, who they seemed to let them go because they had actually family with them because they were trick or treating with family, um, and then three kids they arrested. When they arrested those kids and put them in the van, um, one of the mothers who had been there tried to get the kids to share their parents' phone numbers so that she could call the parents to tell them they'd been arrested. Um, and what happened at that point was a, uh, an officer um, got in front of the window of the uh, van to stop them from doing it. And another officer started yelling at her to shut up. Um, and he was so in her face, I mean, literally, quite literally in her face, uh, that I saw a commanding officer come up to him and kind of push him uh, back. And, and then I went to the local police, priest precinct where the um, kids were taken, and um, uh, neighbors had told the family, the police hadn't told the family that their kids were arrested, but neighbors had. And uh, uh, How old are these kids? The, uh, 12, 14, and 15. Um, and um, the, I, I talked to the family. I waited with them for hours because um, these kids, Kids uh, were held uh, for about uh, five hours, four or five hours, and uh, parents weren't allowed to see them. They were handcuffed uh, the whole time, and um, and this is critical. Um, they actually weren't charged with anything to do uh, with this um, uh, with this crime, and you know, basically a. Uh, uh, um, an officer did come out and said in not so many words, I mean, he did not apologize, but he said in not so many words that um, we understand we got the wrong kids and we're letting them go. We just need to, you know, essentially process that paperwork. Um, and they eventually did let the kids go at about 1 a.m. Um, and uh, no paperwork, no record, no any uh records of what happened they were just told you can go home now and, were they you know, let out the front right. door let, i just i i have uh, one comment and, and a question at this point one i should sure. say i'm familiar with court street and um and the idea that you have a uh cruiser and you know particularly an unmarked one right where the uh where the, yep. where the siren is lower at that at that point Speeding down a one-way street in the opposite direction on Halloween is in any way justified in pursuit of an iPhone or whatever kind of phone it was is, I mean, the story could end right there and there would be a big problem, right? I mean, this is Halloween. There are people all over the place. And it seems to me that if you're going to be doing something like that, it better be for a good reason. There better be a greater threat then you're creating in that moment that you're trying to stop. Uh, that's just my own commentary. And, and, and I, yeah. and, and, and I, I don't know if you ever, uh, if that ever got addressed in, in, in your pursuit of things, but let me also just ask too, um, the, while they were waiting to get released, were, were they themselves processed? In other words, 
were their names, were their fingerprints, were their photos, were they basically put into the system at that point? So it's a good question. Police wouldn't uh, uh, answer that. Um, the the kids, I don't think that they were fingerprinted, but the sort of question of whether they are in the system or not, um, it, one of the mothers who I talked to, um, who amazingly enough, is herself works for the NYPD. She works as a school safety officer, um, has been trying to find out an answer to that question for months and has been unable to uh, do so. Uh, um, so let me, but let me address the uh, uh, comment that you were making before about going the wrong way and you know, whether the risk of that exceeds any benefit of, um, of you know, trying to do what they were uh, trying to do and, and um, you know, the, the way that the police put it to me is in, in obtaining justice. Um, because I think it's a valid question uh, uh, to ask. Um, at the end of the day, what the police told me is something pretty amazing. Um, they didn't say, look, this had been a violent crime and this was appropriate and we're sorry uh, that we, uh, uh, you know, that there was an accident here. Um, but Again, uh, we thought it was a dangerous, uh, you know, crime, and we wanted to get at it. That's not what they said. Um, what they said was it didn't happen. Um, uh, don't believe your own eyes. Don't believe the eyes of your wife uh, or the other witnesses. Um, the uh, the language that they used with me was an unidentified male ran over the hood of a stationary police vehicle. And that is the literal language, which is to say wow. the, the police didn't hit the kid, the kid, the police didn't, you know, the car didn't hit the kid, the kid hit the car. Um, and, and the car was just, for was, whatever reason, parked in the middle of the street in the wrong direction. Yeah, well, they acknowledged it went the wrong way down the street, but they said the car was stationary at the time he ran over the hood. Um, mm -hmm. And... You know, my wife was right there, um, and I ended up speaking to multiple other people who saw exactly what happened. Um, and, and that, to me, you know, it's not – it's a very troubling thing that happened. Um, but what I learned through the course of the reporting is there's a larger context here, which is um, uh, that the police, when something is done wrong, when something is allegedly done wrong uh, by the police, the system for um, holding them accountable uh, and even disciplining officers is, um, uh, frankly, inherently conflicted because it is the NYPD policing itself, and there is legally civilian oversight, but that is not how it works in practice. All right. Well, let's let's go through that. Why don't you um, Why don't you tell us what the theoretical mechanism? in which to hold, and there's really two issues of accountability here, right? One is that they hit a kid with their vehicle. The other is that they <clears throat> rounded up three other kids um, for what appears to be very little reason. And <clears throat> in fact, also, you know, you're talking about 12 and 15 year old kids who are out with other kids with parents. I yeah. mean, I'm just trying to, you know, I, I have a 14 year old daughter. <clears throat> I have uh, done Halloween in this such a circumstance. Um, I got to think that <clears throat> if there's one or two parents out with her friends, that the police are going to allow them to communicate with my daughter. That to me is, is striking. Yeah. So tell us what the theoretical uh, mechanism in which to so, hold them account is and then what. It actually sure. works as right, and then right, right, and then I can go through in in practice. So uh, there are theoretically uh, uh, in 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 law um, essentially two different avenues. One is you know the police have um, internal affairs, right, a unit devoted to investigating the police, and that's a real thing, and it happens. 
Um, but uh, in this case, the police, as I said, decided they didn't do anything wrong. Right? There was nothing to investigate. Um, and so that avenue was closed down. Right? They just decided nothing there. So there's a second uh, avenue, and um, I actually only really learned about it and understood it when I uh, uh, started calling around about this story, which is there's a thing called the Civilian um, – it's actually called the Civilian Complaint Review Board, the CCRB, and it's exactly what it says. Uh, it's a uh, board made up of primarily, although not exclusively, civilians. Um, they still have some NYPD representatives on it, um, but who uh, funded by the mayor, um, uh, you know, don't are not part of the police department, who um, investigate allegations of police abuse, and uh, this board, the CCRB get a lot of them. They get about 7,000 complaints a year, about 3,000 involving physical uh, force, you know, hurting civilians, right? Um, and the CCRB, which um, has, you know, a couple hundred people working for it, they do real investigations, uh, they can get files, um, they actually, in this instance, called my wife. My wife was very impressed uh, by how thorough the investigator was. Um, and um, at that point, they uh, can recommend discipline. Um, and if they find a case is substantiated and they um, decide to move it ahead, uh, they can say that uh, an officer um, should get X or, or Y discipline. Um, but the reality is very simple. The NYPD has complete discretion throughout the process. So the um, uh, commissioner can say, thank you very much for your suggestion of discipline. Um, I am going to uh, take that and put it here in my very special garbage can, and I appreciate it for your service, um, and move along. And it's not a theoretical thing. The uh, NYPD ends up downgrading or dismissing recommendations from the Civilian Oversight Board about two-thirds of the time. Um, and, and that is an under uh, count because the, uh, um, the NYPD can actually decide, we're not even going to let you make recommendations. We're actually going to take the case back before you make recommendations. Um, and, uh, and that is, again, even before that, the reality is the CCRB is often faced with all these um, constraints on its ability to investigate because the NYPD has to cooperate. So just to take one example, you know, body cam footage is obviously critical for these investigations. Well, these civilian investigators don't have direct access to it. They have to email uh, the NYPD, ask for X or Y footage. The NYPD has discretion about sending what the footage that it thinks is relevant. Um, it can redact footage or it can just uh, take its sweet time. So the, there are about a thousand uh, requests for body cam footage from investigators that have been sitting there for more than three months. Wow! And you know, and and let me just sorry, let me get to one kind of upshot of all of this, uh, which is so you have about three thousand complaints a year of physical use of force. Um, what that ends up. Um, amounting to in terms of the discipline that actually happens. So yeah, I looked at 2018 because it's the year for which, most recent year for which there's complete data. Um, nine officers lost uh, vacation days. That's the most severe thing. Um, they lose vacation days. They lose vacation days, nine officers. Yep. How, how many days was it? More than uh, the two? worst one was uh, well, the, the the worst one for a prohibited chokehold uh, was um, thirty days. Uh, the 
but that was a real kind of outlier. Um, the least was one day. Um, wow. uh, yeah. So, so let me ask you this: the um, the records of this body, they're not public either, right? I mean, are these ones that are that are subject to? I think it was Section Fifty um, that prevented any type of disciplinary action or findings from being released in any way? So this is something for which there is a sea change. Um, uh, As you mentioned, there was this law, 50A, in New York State um, that prohibited, made it literally illegal to release any disciplinary records uh, of police, not just in New York City, but anywhere across the state. Um, And that was repealed a couple of weeks ago. So for the first time, we are going to be able to uh, see um, this information from the um, board. But, um, uh, you know, that's going to be a process. And, yeah, up until now, that has been the case. I mean, even if you even if you were the victim of police abuse and the CCRB investigated and found uh, uh, that um, your claims were merited, um, all they could tell you was that the uh, claims were substantiated. They couldn't even tell you what discipline, if any, had uh, happened. Um, Well, first off, the system that existed before 50A was was repealed is nuts. Right. I mean, it's basically like it's almost I mean, it really almost feels like um, we're giving you folks on this uh, civilian uh, complaint review board. You you have a hobby and uh, the you know, the other aspect of that hobby is that you can't share it with anybody <laughs> like it's I mean, I, I feel like my kid doing uh, Legos is more productive. Uh, at the end of the day than what they were doing, because there is absolutely no mechanism in which to act upon what they're doing. And and including the almost like what I would call, I guess, an informal mechanism that at the very least exists now. And we don't know how it's going to function in practice. But theoretically, right, if the uh, civilian complaint review board is doing this work, in building a case and you as a reporter have the ability to go and look at the case, there is some, I, I don't think it's sufficient, but there is at least some like mechanism for accountability, like public, uh, you know, I guess, uh, public pressure, right? Yep. Yep. And I, and I think actually, um, that, uh, you know, my guess is that that's going to happen. That's going to happen in some fashion, uh, unless, by the way, uh, one possibility is that uh, uh, the police unions, which have very much opposed uh, the repeal of this law, could, uh, uh, you know, file a lawsuit and uh, try to sort of throw some sand in it. But um, but yeah, I, I, I think that barring that, um, we are going to be able to um, know names um, and know what's happening. And um, and I think it's going to be very revelatory because, you know, we should be clear the, the um, most officers have had very few, if any, complaints against them and um, have certainly not had uh complaints substantiated against them. But what you do see, and you can quite literally see this in the chart, is that um, that it's a little bit of a uh, of a kind of you. You know, most officers haven't had uh, complaints against them. Um, a few have had a few complaints against them. And then a bunch have had a lot of complaints against them. This is this is the <laughs> sort of the 80 20 rule, right? 20, 80 percent of the complaints come yep. from 20 percent of the people. Yeah, right. I mean, the stats are not quite that, um, right. but they are. But it is exactly that idea. And that dynamic. Um, and in fact, you have, um, if I'm remembering the number correctly, 753. Again, this is as of 2018. 
officers active in the force, right? Those current police officers who had had two or more complaints substantiated against them. And remember, it's very difficult for a case to be substantiated given all the impediments. Um, and 200, about 200 plus who had three or more complaints substantiated against them. Wow. Um, and, you know, that's a, that's a thing. How, now, how so, do you know that? How do you know that uh, statistic only because they develop statistics that are that are not tied to a specific officer or I mean, sure, how do you yeah, find right. how do you find out? Uh, the, the, the CCRB puts out these annual reports and has monthly reports where they tally all this stuff. And it's a weird combination of incredibly revelatory and incredibly useless. Right? right, because revelatory, because well, I don't know if I want to say this, holy shit, there are hundreds of officers on the force who've had repeated substantiated complaints against them. And of course, useless because, well, who are these officers? What do we right. do now? And you can't do anything, right? So now, again, with the repeal of 50A, that's going to change. But, but, um, but the issue I was highlighting is not, at least at the moment, which is the question of, well, what happens to those officers and who gets to decide? And right now, the answer to that is usually nothing, and it's the NYPD that decides. Right. And and, and the idea that, um, and I, you know, it remains to be seen, you know, how it works with this pr- type of pressure. And if an officer, you know, has uh, three uh, incidences of confirmed, you know, uh, confirmed complaints, uh, and the, then all of a sudden the, the infrastructure that allows that officer to go out and have contact with people, uh, frankly, um, there's, there's theoretically a little bit more accountability, but we don't also don't know, you know, if that's going to work, it could be, it could be overwhelming. We don't know, uh, that there'll be the reporters to push this. We don't know that there'll be a public outcry. There is that, that becomes more of a, uh, public relations uh, um, uh, lever as opposed to any type of institutional lever again to hold them to account. There is a, uh, I mean, it just sort of feels like, um, the, the, the civilian complaint review board is the place where complaints go to die. <laughs> right. I mean, it's like, a uh, you know, what they say about the Senate in terms of, of good ideas that, that this just, this is where they keep it. And then they, this is where they, it's behind essentially a paywall and um, that is impenetrable. And this is where it goes to die. So getting back to your original story, did, was there any at the end of this, as you're sort of doggedly following this, um, this story through, you know, all the, the means in which you could pursue it. Um, what, where did it finally land? I mean, what answers did you get any answers and, and people got to be aware you're an investigative journalist. You're not, you know, right. just a uh, a parent who is worried about their kid or trying to find out. I mean, this, the idea that someone who works at the police department and cannot find out exactly whether their own child is in the system because of this is, um, I mean, it's it's even in some ways is even more disturbing, right? Um, like, you know, wh- who they're willing to sort of, uh, protect in, in in what situations, but um, so you as an a uh, investigative journalist, could you find out what what went on through this process? So so I um, uh, have um, uh, uh, the answer to that. The short answer to that is no. Um, the um, reason why is, um, again, gets back to the NYPD's power throughout the process. So, um, first of all, I, of course, asked the NYPD itself, um, asked them for information, not only about the case, but um, a- about this, uh, uh, the discretion they have over the system and, you know, how it works. And I um, repeatedly uh, ask them for their perspective, for their understanding uh, of it. And I've quite literally not heard back, Um, not since they gave me a statement back in 
written back in November. Um, you know, and I sent uh, four different requests for comment over the past uh, few weeks. Um, so, you know, that's where it stands with them. There is this investigation um, uh, by the CCRB into the incident. Um, and um, it is uh, not complete, and they can't tell me anything because it is not complete. And a, a couple of other things that would um, that suggest it could take a while. One is uh, NYPD officers have not done any interviews with CCRB investigators since mid-March when the pandemic began, and that's because police unions, NYPD unions, decided that um, police shouldn't have to do any remote interviews. A uh, 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 police union um, representative said, we don't do Zoom, right? Um, they just decided they're not going to do that. <laughs> um, and uh, you've also had um, an enormous number of um, specific complaints and allegations about NYPD abuse during the protests. Um, I think 170 different uh, complaints. Um, and, uh, and meanwhile, the CCRB is facing a budget cut from the mayor. So um, you're going to be dealing with a big backlog. The, um, uh, this case is open and uh, 2,800 cases are open, uh, to, you know. Right, so lastly, uh, Eric, is there, uh, and this may be outside of your, uh, your, your, your portfolio portfolio here, but, um, is there any buddy, is there a politician? Is there an organization? Is there a, uh, package of legislation somewhere, which is attempting to address this specific aspect of it. I mean, I think, you know, uh, obviously um, the one of the big asks or demands, I should say, of of, of protesters and I think, uh, uh, frankly, a large portion of the American population is to divert uh, funds away from the police into um, other, uh, you know, uh, services essentially to provide a lot of the work that the police do. But this this process of accountability is really not implicated in it. I mean, hopefully there would be less of these, but it wouldn't necessarily be treated any differently. Does someone have is there a a concrete response to this problem? And, and is there a broader awareness of it? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I have actually, um, to be honest, asked that very question of uh of uh politicians in new york um and uh because you're right m most of um the proposals and most of the discussion um have had to do with uh money and other aspects and um you know this is um uh, uh, I, I would imagine that to um you know, to truly address uh, abuse by the police, you, you would need to have independent, truly empowered uh, mechanisms for holding them uh, accountable. Um, and, um, you know, that's certainly not how it works right now in, uh, in New York City. And, and and do you know of anybody who's got uh, you know any ideas? Is there uh, you know if, if if listeners want to take the next step and find out like okay, um, I'm aware of this problem. Let me go support uh, or amplify or uh, the people who are working uh, you know, so on it. There there have been a number of uh, of you know politicians who've been quite active uh, in New York City um, regarding. Uh, uh, Police reform generally. The honest answer is I don't know any who've advocated specifically on this issue. And actually, to tell you the truth, I, you know, like I said, I've actually um, contacted politicians um, to ask them if they have specific proposals. And um, I, I wish this weren't the case, but uh, uh, but I, I have yet to hear uh, um, of any um, specific uh, proposals. 
Well, Eric, um, uh, the uh, that I think you know indicates just how important your piece is, and um, uh, so I appreciate you coming on and and talking to us about it. And I hope uh, people will um, will will follow it and read it and um, and and pass it around because it's a very important perspective on uh, one aspect I think of of the problem of the police that is not uh, really being directly addressed. Uh, I appreciate your time, Eric. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.